All right, I don't know if we're going to get a whole lot more folks here, so we might as well get started. Um, I'm Tim Lin. I'm a web developer here. Uh, I'm working on Profile 2.0. Uh, particularly, I'm working on some of the data viz stuff that we're going to feature in the new right rail. Um, and tonight, we're going to talk about uh, Ajax at LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot of um, live coding here. I do have a, a, a few uh, examples. Um, it's hard to do a workshop with this because you have to be running a server because of the way um, you know, Ajax is doing requests. It's not just pulling up file stuff. Um, so uh, some of the demos will be live and, or I mean, on production, and a couple will be just running locally here. Uh, so just a brief overview of what we'll cover. We'll talk briefly about what Ajax is. I'm, you know, you guys all know what it is, but I'll uh, give you a few details there. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about why we use libraries. Um, the two main verbs that we often encounter are get and post, and why you want to use one over the other. Uh, a little bit about CSRF tokens, and then uh, we'll just show uh, a little bit about how we do it here. So in a nutshell, uh, you know it stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, so typically, the transport method we use is XHR. It's uh, XML HTTP request. And so a lot of times, if you're talking to a web dev, you'll hear him say, oh, you know, this is an XHR request. That's what he means. Um, it's used often to, do, uh, to just fetch things dynamically, so you don't have to do a full page refresh. Um, a lot of times, we have simple actions on the site, liking a comment or doing inline comments. Uh, these simple actions are great uh, candidates for doing anything through AJAX. Uh, despite XML being in the acronym, uh, XML is rarely used here. Uh, I think almost, I can't think of uh, any of the apps that I've worked on that are actually still using XML. Uh, primarily, we use JSON and uh, HTML snippets. Uh, particularly, uh, JSON is getting more and more used because we're switching to Dust, where pretty much everything is JSON. Uh, but in general, whatever is the easiest to implement and the lightest is a good way to go. So just some examples uh, here about where we use it on production. Um, so on the home page, if you see this, this is a screenshot from uh, Firebug. You see we have some continuous polling in there. And that all that does is it determines if there are updates and how many of their updates there are to show. Upon clicking on that see new 40 or 48 new updates, you see this get where it hits real time. Um, we return uh, an HTML block. And that's just one of those examples where it's very easy for the developer to just grab raw HTML from the server response and inject it dynamically. Um, we, have, we have ways to uh, reparse that HTML that comes back so it can look for any new controls that have been delivered, initialize them so they're all ready to go for the user. Uh, the navigation for the inbox. Uh, as soon as you mouse over that, it, does, it sends off a request to get the status of your inbox. And, um, previews of any me new messages that are there. Groups. This is where we use, uh, we use some JSON here for uh, just to confirm a simple action like like. Uh, and ads. Uh, because the, we, have, we have to uh, verify our, that all the, the language used in an ad does not violate any of our uh, blacklists. So here we, you see I, I used a bad word, and I get flagged for it. Uh, ads is still using a, um, a deprecated uh, method called DWR. What that does, it's kind of like an RPC where it exposes these Java methods to the JavaScript side. And so that's why this format looks a little weird, where you have var s0. Um, this looks nothing like what we do on uh, Frontier and Leo pages. But it's the same, same sort of idea. So how do we handle all these different responses? Um, I told you before, like, you know, we don't really use XML much because it's a little bit heavier weight. But we prefer um, JSON and HTML. So just to give you an idea of the code snippets to handle just a simple um, injecting a response from uh, one of these requests. See, with the XML response, we have to, um, we're fooling with an actual uh, directory tree or DOM tree. Although it's not actually on the page, it, does, it still has the same methods that are available that when you're parsing a DOM. So we have to get, we have to get elements. We have to look at it for, at, at the children. We have to navigate that, that DOM. Uh, with JSON and HTML, it's much simpler. All we have to do is parse it and inject it. Um, so you might be wondering why we, uh, why we have to use a library here. Um, we're using YUI 2.9, I think it is, or 2.8. <clears throat> um, and the reason lies in that uh, AJAX is really old. Um, Microsoft originally introduced it as an ActiveX object, I think, with Outlook Express back in 99. Um, and it wasn't really until uh, 04 that it was widely adopted by uh, WebKit and Mozilla. And 
as such, there's a lot of legacy stuff that's still lingering around. So the first, the first condition in this try catch block is going to satisfy most of the current browsers. Um, in fact, IE7 and above will, will, will work with that. This legacy stuff is still around for IE6, um, and there are actually different versions of the, uh, of the ActiveX object that were out there. So this is, a little, this is a little contrived. It doesn't have to be quite so complex, but um, as you see, there's still a lot of support you need to test for. And then finally, you have to go ahead and add your callback, check the ready state, check the status of the request. On the other hand, with, with YUI, it's ridiculously simple. It's two lines, and you're ready to go. You can easily fire off your request and do whatever you want with it. Uh, we are slowly transitioning to jQuery. I think the new homepage that we're seeing now uh, for uh, internal tests is using some jQuery, uh, and Profile2 will also be using jQuery. But it's kind, of a, it's kind of mixed right now. We haven't fully transitioned to one or the other. So then we have the two verbs that, we, that you see a lot, get and, get and post. Um, so get, think of get as you're going to get something, you know, it's, a, it's an existing resource on the server. So search results are a really great example of this, something that you can bookmark so you can come back to it later much easier. It has limitations in that it's, uh, it's limited in length. I think IE8 and below are limited to 2,083 characters, whereas WebKit and Chrome, or WebKit and uh, Mozilla go uh, much longer than that. Um, and it also results in logged entry and your access logs. So if you see here my, my little example, uh, it passes any parameters that are, that are passed through in a GET request are logged in plain text. So if you, you definitely want to use this for any sort of user registration flow. Uh, post, on the other hand, think of it as you're creating something on the server. The data size is only limited by the server. Uh, I think PHP comes out of the box with an eight megabyte limit. So it's great for uploading images, um, things like that. Uh, and like I said, it does not result in uh, params getting exposed in the logs. So that same request uh, just comes through without exposing anything. So the response of the request can be longer? Uh, is there any limit on that? Uh, the response, the, no, the response is not limited okay. in either of those situations. Oh yeah, by the way, if you guys have questions, please uh, uh, feel free to ask. Um, I'll, I'll try, or if you can use the mic, go ahead. I'll just repeat the question for anybody who might be watching online. Uh, so as a layer of security, LinkedIn, we, at LinkedIn, and this is actually really common practice, uh, we use these CSRF tokens. And these are, these are used to prevent cross-site request forgeries. And so we get it for free with any form that we output in Leo and Frontier. Um, I'm not sure of the other applications. Uh, I know we have some Grail stuff here and some, some Ruby as well, I think. Um, I'm not sure if they've been uh, modified to automatically output the CSRF token in their forms, uh, but most likely they are. So these tokens typically are composed of a user's session ID and then they're hashed so that they're um, very, very difficult to guess and, uh, and forge. Um, and this is an idea of what it looks like uh, in any of our forms. You just have that hidden uh, CSRF token parameter and then it includes that long string of characters. Uh, if it's missing or tampered with, uh, the, you'll get, I think the error is a 503, um, and it's a request error. <clears throat> and in some cases, we'll actually redirect you to um, a login flow. Uh, like I said, they come free in, in, our, form in our form tags. Uh, however, there are other cases where you need to include an action or the token in a GET request. So for instance, the, uh, the like that I showed you earlier, or follow company. You have to explicitly define that this is, a, this is you're taking uh, an action for the user. And so in this case, you include the action method. And what that does is it, it just includes the CSRF token in the, uh, as a URL parameter. Additionally, there is this inherit protocol method as well. Uh, and you might not know it, but uh, Ajax has a same origin policy, which means that any request going out from your page cannot cross it, it can't cross uh, met, or protocols, it can't cross uh, ports or subdomains. So in this case, we have this new inherit protocol method, which tells the link to adopt whatever the parent page's protocol is. So, because we had, we had issues in the past where we might be on an HTTP page, and this was generating an HTTPS link, or vice versa. And so the op, that, that link then fails. Uh, in Dust, it's almost, uh, almost the same thing. We have this uh, Ajax pre-tag, and that takes care of maintaining the protocol. And all you have to do is include the, uh, the action, uh, 
the ops action. And that will make sure to include the CSRF token in there. So how do we do it at LinkedIn? First up is our methodology on web dev. Uh, this is common to pretty much everything we build in web dev, where we, we've adopted a thing called uh, progressive enhancement, which means that we start from the base functionality of a web page, and we assume that the lowest common denominator is using it, which means a form has to submit. A for, uh, you have to be able to go through a flow. And even if it's painstaking, you're, going, you're, you're updating one part of a, of a form at a time on each page, the users can, can still get through it. So it's, it's useful for, for situations that arise, CDN goes down, and you don't have any JS or CSS coming through. Or you're on some uh, device or uh, browser that we hadn't anticipated. And so that way, you can still use the site in its most basic fashion. On top of that, we, layer, we start layering things like the JavaScript, the CSS. And so that's where you get the behavior and the nice looking styles that we have. Additionally, you don't want to interfere with the user. Um, Anytime we provide a link on the page, the link should be able to function both within the, the, the dynamic context that you had expected, but the user should also be able to right click on that and say, open in a new tab. Um, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen when he clicks that link, so maybe he just wants to make sure that he maintains this spot in the page, on the site and uh, still be able to do whatever that link does. Question. Yeah? How does uh, this progressive enhancement work with Dust? Is that basically assembled on the client side? Yeah, so the question was, um, how, does, how does a progressive enhancement work with, in the Dust world? Um, right now, it doesn't. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, and I, I, I apologize, I don't know uh, enough about uh, Dust and Fizzy and USSR, but the goal it will be to have these, uh, the templates built on the server and then have uh, most of the base page delivered in a static fashion. Um, there will still be things that are fetched dynamically, uh, the way the Dust is working now, um, but I think uh, the goal will, when we, when we finally launch Dust for, uh, for, you know, for general audience, it will be uh, mostly assembled on the server. I hope that's the case anyway, because it, it, yeah, it does fly right in the face of, of this whole methodology. Uh, so just to give you an example of what I mean by the progressive enhancement, uh, this is our LinkedIn company page. And you say we have the follow company button, and you can click it right there, it fires off the request, and everything is done right within the page. But additionally, you can, if you want, go ahead and open that in a new tab. And I have to, there is actually a bug with that, I think. Um, hold on. I'm already following that company. But the action still succeeded, despite not being done through, uh, through XHR. And that should have stopped following. It did. Okay. So that's what I wanted to illustrate with that. So behind all this is LI async request. This is used uh, quite regularly throughout the site. Um, and all it is is a proxy to the YUI async request uh, function. Um, it has some built-in uh, helpers, and it, primarily that it sets this X is Ajax form uh, header, and that's used for the primarily in the frontier world, where it can it can distinguish between an Ajax request and a full page request. And in the case of the Ajax request, it can return JSON or it can return an HTML snippet. In the case of the full page refle refresh, um, it can just maintain the same, like, as though this was not done through an Ajax request. Um, it, takes, uh, it, takes, it takes three parameters, which is the verb you're using, uh, either get or post, um, the URL you want to hit, and a callback. And by default, you, don't, you actually don't even have to pass in a callback. You can let this succeed silently. Uh, for instance, we use it for, uh, for some tracking events, and we don't really care about the response from the server. We just want to fire it off and forget about it. So in that case, we don't really need a, a response. On top of that, we often use Frontier Ajax form. Uh, this is particularly for, uh, obviously, forms, but it, it's uh, also a UI control. So whereas this one is, this is actually just a, a function you can call pretty much anywhere. This is a, a control you have to instantiate using the control framework. 
Um, what this does is uh, when the user interacts from, with a form and then hits submit, it puts a mask over the form and prevents the user from actually uh, being able to focus any of the fields. To et so you can't alter the text that's in there. You can't submit it again. It also provides a little spinner that shows that, hey, something's going on. Um, it has some of its own uh, success and failure callbacks in there, uh, but you can also provide your own as well. So that is hopefully not too fast, but that's really a lot of the, like the, the background that I wanted to give you about Ajax at LinkedIn. Uh, the following are just going to be some examples of uh, some, some things that I wrote locally, just so you can see how this works in, uh, in, in progress here. So let me... So this is just a simple form. This is using Frontier Ajax form. And we tampered with the CSRF token in this. So it's going to open my debugger here. And you'll see some of the, uh, some of the, some of the response that we go through. Um, by default, all of the responses from the server from, uh, that, that use Frontier Ajax form or LI async request, they come back as JSON. And they all include this throw uh, li colon dbe. And that's just a little token we put in there to know that the JSON response actually came from us. Uh, we copied that from Google. So that's why it's LinkedIn, don't be evil. Um, OK. So in this case, our status came back as CSRF. And that's one of the standard responses from Frontier. There's auth, there's OK, there's fail, and there's CSRF. Um, CSRF means that we have another step where we'll try to do it, where the Frontier Ajax form, it'll collect all the form data on the page, create a, uh, a plain HTML form, and resubmit that manually, which will then, instead of turning, it'll, it'll take this from an Ajax re response to a full page flow. Um, and this isn't, like, I'm not set up to handle that right now. So what you get up, what you end up with is just a plain, uh, plain looking uh, JSON error. But if you see, the, uh, the URL did change, because it actually it posted my data to the, to the form action. Uh, another another uh, feature we have in this is to handle uh, automatic redirects. Um, and you see, the way to trigger this is to just include a hidden uh, parameter called location with the, uh, that contains the URL that you want to go to. So in this case, we have our response text. It'll, it'll keep going. And so part of the response that we received was this location parameter. And all it is, it's just a simple, simple URL. And then down here, we catch it again. We say, OK, status is all right. And we found out we have a location. And we don't have any HTML content that was returned. If there's HTML content, that takes precedence. Um, that will get into, injected into the page. But in this case, that's blank. And so all we're going to do is do a, uh, a window location. And it just sends you directly to that place. And then we have some of the uh, other features that are built into, the, into async request. It has built-in error handling. So you can inject a, a top-level error um, at the top of the page. Uh, it also has uh, field validation. So any, any, um, any particular field that the, server, that the server tries to validate and finds an error on, it'll inject the, uh, the error right there in the markup for you. And in this case, with the successful registration, I have a custom callback uh, that will get fired. My custom callback did not clear the, the global error, but it, in, it injected the response from the server, uh, uh, the success response for the server dynamically into the page. Uh, so one of the, the, the things I talked about earlier was that Ajax is uh, same, same domain, it has a same domain policy or same origin policy. Um, and that's something that you can violate pretty easily when you're working in dev. Uh, lots of times we're working, uh, you might be 
you know, debugging with somebody and you're hitting their back end uh, and the links might end up pointing to a different port uh, or a different protocol. And so this cross-origin error is actually really easy to do in dev. Uh, it's also kind of mysterious sometimes. So I'll show you, I just wanted to show you what it looks like when you actually do this. Because um, a lot of times it'll fail silently and you have no idea until you actually look at the, uh, the net, your network uh, tab, what's going on. This is going to work. Okay. So in this case, we get a failure because the, the transaction that didn't actually succeed. Um, and it tries to manually submit the form again. Um, where is it? So this is, this is the request that we sent out that did not work. And you see it's using this weird verb, options. And the only time I've ever seen this is when I've encountered a cross-origin error. Um, both WebKit and Mozilla uh, use the same verb when this occurs. So it's something that if, if you're writing these scripts and nothing is working, you can't figure out why, take a look at the net tab and look for this options uh, verb. Finally, especially today with QD2, um, <laughs> you're likely to encounter a timeout. Uh, by default, we use, I think, a 25 or 30 second timeout with uh, async request, uh, but it is, it is configurable. Uh, and so we, I, I triggered this to do to timeout after five seconds, and all it does is it calls our failure handler, which will again try to manually submit whatever form you were, you were just trying to you were just trying to uh, submit. And that actually is the end of my uh, my slides. Um, like I said, I didn't want to. But didn't want you guys to bring your laptops because this is, you know, you have to be running a server to test out and work with any of this stuff. So it's, it's hard to do uh, the, the pre-talk setup. Um, so I hope this was still somewhat informative for you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let them rip. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question was that when I set the timeout that I just had a query parameter. Uh, that's uh, my little uh, demo. Uh, PHP, so it knows to sleep for 30 seconds if I pass in timeout. Uh, timeout is actually a configuration parameter. Uh, you, can, uh, you can pass to the li async request function. Uh, so any, anytime uh, you use it, one of the config options is just uh, timeout. And so you can give it, uh, it's, it's in milliseconds, so you just pass in how many milliseconds you want. Mm -hmm. And that was what was being rendered by default? Yeah, so the, uh, the question was about the form validators. Um, so all the validation actually occurs on the server side. Uh, and that's where we do any logic for you know, blank, duplicate, and stuff like that. And what it does is it sets a, let me see if I can actually show you uh, what the, the payload would look like. So it passes in, so it has this form collection. I hope you can see it here. Uh, and it actually it specifies the, the name of the field that has the error. And so we have a naming convention on, in the markup that has username hyphen error, and it's just a span, an empty span tag. And so uh, async request knows to go look for that ID and dynamically inject the, whatever error it was returned for it. Uh, and that's how it also, it, 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 it works very similar to the global error as well. Like, all the global error does is it looks for, we have, a, um, we have an ID that we have on the, uh, the top banner where we inject success or error messages, and it just injects whatever is returned there for it. So they, what's, what's good is that they come back all internationalized and containing any uh, dynamic data that we need. Any other questions?
on part of the automatic failure handler was trying to manually submit the form. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a tangential question, but can you talk about why we decided to do that versus just throwing an error message? At that point? Yeah. Um, so the the manual submission can occur for uh, lots of different reasons for um, the CSRF, uh, for timeout, for off failures. Um, and the reason we try that is because we have, uh, I think in, in the back end, we have some logic that can uh, maintain some of the data that you're, you're, trying, to do, you're trying to use. So if we, if we submit the, 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 the full form um, manually, uh, then the full page flow can take over. So if you, if you have to get prompted to log in again, it'll prompt the, the login and then hopefully continue with that submission. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been starting to play with Restly, which also is returning JSON, and I was wondering whether you're seeing any of that sort of being passed up to the browser level and whether you have any experience in handling that in the UI, the Restly format of JSON. Uh, no. So the Restly stuff, uh, we don't, we're not equipped to handle that with, uh, with the, the controls that I showed you today. Um, so the most of that is uh, so that, that's that's what we use with um, the JavaScript API, the Restly stuff. I think. I'm not sure. So <laughs> too many too many uh, names and acronyms. It's the uh, new uh, sort of backend uh, data format and uh, transfer mechanism that's replacing the Java RPC, but it's all JSON encoded. And I was wondering if there's cases where the data that's coming from like way down below is appropriate for actually. Okay. That's working out if it is. Okay. So the question was about uh, Restly, and since that's that's replacing some of our uh, RPCs, if uh, any of that data from Restly is coming up to the, the front end, um, in my experience so far, no, uh, I haven't I haven't uh, started using any of the Restly stuff, um, and I haven't seen any of our uh, I haven't seen it on the, on the profile side yet, so I, I don't know um, when we're going to start handling that. Uh, the other big mystery is uh, Dust. Um, I know Dust comes with its, a, lot of, a lot of its own helpers to do some of the stuff that we're, we, we've been doing in Frontier and Leo. Um, and I imagine we're going to be rewriting um, some of this stuff so it works in both worlds. Anybody else? All right. I think that's it. Thanks for coming out.